Well, thank you. It's great to be here, and it's it's really exciting to see uh, so many people um, with us today. As John mentioned earlier, when we were first talking about this, uh, we really didn't know uh, what what type of response we'd get. But it's just um, you know great to see so many people here and so many enthusiastic people. On top of that. Um, I really want to make this a conversation with all of you as well. So uh, Mary Catherine and I can sit up here and talk, but I think it'd be much more interesting uh, to hear what's on your mind and to take your questions. Uh, Mary Catherine, is, as probably most of you know, is, uh, is a contributor to Fox News. Um, you can regularly spot her uh, on TV. Um, she's been doing that now for, for a couple of years. And uh, she's been blogging throughout the course of uh, the last few months. And uh, post-election will be there as well at the Weekly Standard. Um, so I'd encourage you to check out the Weekly Standards blog, and she'll be, you know, uh, like I say, continuing to, to write for them. Her, uh, she previously worked for townhall.com, which, as many of you know, uh, has a long history with the Heritage Foundation. And, uh, and prior to working for Town Hall, Mary Catherine was actually at the Heritage Foundation uh, working for uh, the Insider uh, with Bridget Wagner in our coalitions department. So um, I wanted to begin today, uh, naturally, since we're just less than a week away, a week after the election, to ask Mary Catherine, um, about a, s a statistic that I, I found very uh, surprising and, and kind of startling. Um, and that was the fact that young voters, by a two to one margin, supported Barack Obama over John McCain. And also, they comprised about 18% of the electorate, which was up from the 2004 levels. And some people have argued uh, provided the necessary margin of victory in, in a few of the key swing states. So, with that being said, Mary Catherine, how significant? Are young voters today, and uh, why do you think they overwhelmingly supported Barack Obama? Well, first of all, and I'm not doing this because I'm a TV person and trained not to answer the question, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but I did want to say hi to everybody and thank you for having me. It's really it's nice to be here at Heritage. I'm firmly part of the conspiracy. Do not fear me. Um, <clears throat> I'm back again. Um, it's nice to be here with a bunch of young activists who are really doing yeoman's work, very important work out in the states. Um, while I get to play around in, in Washington, D.C., in, in the mud here. Um, <clears throat> so I appreciate all that you guys do. And uh, as far as young voters go, I was actually thinking before I got here, um, you know, what are our lessons going forward? And how do we, you know, we're going to have to learn how to connect with young voters and not just the 80 of us in the room. Um, and I was thinking, you know, maybe, maybe we can draw some lessons from reality TV. Because, you know, that's what young folks like, right? So I did. I watched all, all week long. I was very diligent. I watched reality TV all week so that I could glean these lessons for you guys. Number one, I learned from Tyra Banks on America's Next Top Model that you have to want it really bad. <laughs> That's number one. Number one principle. Number two, on Project Runway, I learned from Heidi Klum that you have to get really creative. Like, if they want you to make a dress out of corn husks, you need to be able to do that. <laughs> and in the conservative movement, sometimes that's all we're working with. So <laughs> the, we've got the media to contend with. In this election, we had a, a bad incumbent year to contend with and an economic, the economic fallout. So you know, corn husks, get ready. And number three, I was watching TLC, which has a lot of shows like, uh, I think it's TLC, has John and Kate plus eight, and more importantly, 17 kids and counting which is a show about the very conservative Duggar family of Arkansas that has 17 kids and an 18th on the way, which teaches me that if either of the first two do not work, we're going to have to breed ourselves out of this. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the other reason that we brought you guys together today. And we're going we're gonna to do the speed dating part of the, of the, of the program right after we're done, and, uh, and you guys can go and, and work for the conservative movement. So, <laughs> oh, I'm too fresh for heritage. Um, no, but I think young voters, young voters were extremely important. I think I have to thank uh, Patrick Ruffini for doing the math on this. I'm not the math person. Um, who determined that the margin, the increase in, in young voters uh, may have cost us 72 electoral votes. If you, mm. if you spread it out all over the whole nation, the 1% increase in young voters um, would have accounted for the margin, perhaps even without the economic fallout hurting us. Uh, this is obviously a change from the Reagan years when we could count on the young vote, and even the Bush years when we, uh, we did count on at least a, a greater majority than, than what we had this year. It's something we're going to have to work on seriously. I want to talk about a couple... Um, they're going to sound sort of surface, surfacey and, and, uh, and perhaps shallow things, but I think they're going to be important coming up. 
Number one, um, before we get into philosophy, number one is uh, branding, which I think, and this is, a, a, this is a, uh, an opportunity for all the wordsmiths and perhaps the graphic designers in the audience. Um, the Obama campaign was one of the greatest branded campaigns ever. I mean, and we're dealing with a young uh, constituency of voters who are used to having their things packaged nicely, looking beautiful in all aspects. Um, I think the real, the metaphor for this is, is when you get an Apple computer. I don't know if you guys, probably a lot of folks use Mac. When you get an Apple computer in the mail, it comes in this beautiful box and all of the, all of the writing is uniform and there's graphics and it's clearly clear that a lot of thought went into this. Uh, I think on the right, that's something we're missing. The guys who branded the Obama campaign are folks who think like the Apple packagers. And uh, that's, I think to some extent, it's unfortunate that we have to sell a presidential candidate like an iPod. Um, <laughs> but the fact is that that's part of what we need to be doing. Uh, I think the left has always gotten the jump on us on, on some, some uh, words like the green movement and, and sort of framing issues. And, uh, and that's where it comes down to more deep policy things. And we need to think about uh, how we're doing that moving forward. For instance, one of Barack Obama calls his, uh, his redistribution of wealth a tax cut. We need to be mindful of that and branding our own ideas as things that give people control and give them individual choice and are actually empowering um, and not oppressive. So that's one of the things I think. I don't want to like filibuster here. So. No, no. <laughs> Woo, excuse me. Um, well, p please, if you, had, if you had other suggestions, otherwise I can, I can go on. I mean, the, the one thing that Lee Edwards, who's with us today, pointed out was that um, looking back to the 1964 race, uh, Barry Goldwater actually received 48% of the youth vote compared to LBJ's 52. And that was, right. I believe, probably the, cl the closest it's been, at least in the last half century. So. Um, was it the issues? Um, or, what, I mean, was it just the was it just the branding problem, or or are or, or, uh, the conservative candidates, the Republican candidates, talking about the wrong issues? Um, I think. Am I still working here? I didn't break myself, did I? Okay. Um, I think one problem we ran into is, um, and I, I don't want to sit here and denigrate President Bush because I I think he took plenty of that on the trail this year, and uh, and there are many things that I would defend him on, but I think as far as conservatism goes, in a lot of ways. We've got a young generation coming up that came to, came into their political own during the Bush years, and uh, much of that was overtaken by the war, which two wars, in fact, which I think are, were, from my point of view, were right for us to get involved in and right for us to defend. Um, but that took up a lot of energy and a lot of the, became a lot of the picture of the conservative movement over the last eight years. So you got a bunch of kids who weren't even involved with the, uh, the run up to the war. And all they've heard is uh, Bush lied, people died. And in fact, I, I was talking to somebody the other day where uh, Doug Fife went, uh, who was involved in the administration uh, uh, and the decision to go to war in Iraq, spoke at Yale last week to a bunch of undergrads. And when you can get uh, young people in there who've never heard this argument before, it's like a light bulb in there. <laughs> they've never realized that there was actually an intellectual argument for going to war, that there was an actual rigorous discussion and debate before we went there, and that, uh, that Democrats were deeply involved in this. Um, but I think, aside from the war, which I'm going to address in a second, <clears throat> the domestic issues and the spending um, really wiped out our claim, or the Republican Party's claim, not the conservative movement's claim, because Heritage and other folks were very stalwart in, in opposing these things, um, but wiped out our claim to good government uh, in many ways. And I think that's the, that's the part of conservatism that rings true. Uh, that's what Obama was using on the, the campaign trail, talking about, I'm going to go through the budget line by line. Yeah, when I see a Democrat do that, I will become one. Um, <laughs> and uh, and uh, what else was he uh, talking about? Going through each federal agency and deciding what, what does and doesn't work. We'll wait and see, guys. Don't hold your breath. Um, but I think that's the part of our message that works, and it got drowned out partly by the war and then partly by our, our party's own malfeasance in, in those ways. So we have to do a lot of convincing, um, perhaps not to that group that just came through, because they may, they may be stuck in that, that way of seeing things for, for quite a while. But I think there's an opportunity with people coming up during the Barack Obama uh, presidency that we could create a lot of real intellectual allies on, on, uh, on college campuses who, you know, see things for how they really are and, and 
perhaps are dis disaffected by the, uh, by the Barack Obama presidency. So that's where our, our, our opportunity lies. And I don't, want to, I don't want to write off all the people who've just come through either. There's obviously opportunity there as well. The second thing is on the war, we've got a bunch of great young leaders who are in fact in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and they're going to be coming home. Many of them have come home already. Um, I point to the guys who, who started Vets for Freedom. Um, David Bellavia, who's a staff sergeant in Iraq, nominated for the uh, Medal of Honor. One of the very few living people nominated for the Medal of Honor. Really amazing guy. Um, Pete Hegseth, who served in Iraq. Kate Norley, who served in Iraq. These guys really saw a political opportunity, a place where they were needed to make the case for the war and, and for the aggressive fight on the war on terror and went there and did that job after they had done the, the arduous job of going overseas for years at a time. Um, they came back here and they, they waged a battle here. And those guys are gonna be instrumental as we move forward, at least on a foreign policy stance of, of defending these things. Um, they've got the creds for it. They're great leaders. They're, many of them are great dynamic speakers and, and, uh, and magnetic personalities. And I look forward to seeing the rest of them come up and really the Republican Party would behoove itself to get them involved and make sure that they're running in races, which some of them are already. In fact, Steve Stivers, I think is his last name, was able to keep Deborah Price's seat in Ohio. He was a Vets for Freedom backed veteran candidate. Um, so those guys are people to watch out for. Not a good year for them, but as we move forward, I think uh, in, in subsequent years, they'll get their chance. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and I've met some of the people who you named, and, and they are very dynamic. Yeah. I mean, that's the. Um, they certainly have a great appreciation for for our country, and, uh, and and I think you probably will see in 2010 or 2012 um, more of them run for house seats right. and, and maybe even start out on a lower level. One of the things that I think excited a lot of young people back in August, uh, and and I, I think you saw this through Facebook, and and you obviously saw it through donations to the McCain campaign, was the selection of Sarah Palin, um, who is young herself, a more a lot more youthful than John McCain. Right. Um, what role do you see, looking ahead, to her playing both in maybe the Republican Party and running for president herself, but more in shaping conservatism and, and reaching out to younger people? Well, as you guys know, there's been a, quite a battle over this in Washington. Um, and it's been framed as a sort of elites versus you know, regular Americans kind of thing going on. Um, I'm sort of a middle of the road around Sarah Palin. I really, really like her in my, in my gut. I like Sarah Palin. Um, my worry would be that we necessarily say, oh, because, she, and she is a great magnetic superstar, and uh, the Republican Party is not, does not have the luxury of tossing such people away, <laughs> okay, um, number one. But um, my only concern going forward is that we would not anoint her as the voice of uh, conservatism necessarily um, at the expense of all others. Uh, I think that she could very well be fit to be that person. I think. People who argue that she, she lacks some intellectual acumen um, to be the voice of conservatism, I think, are missing the point that she has, she has not only good political instincts, she has good philosophical instincts. And they come from the fact that she ran businesses, raised children, and ran a government. Uh, and she saw where things can go bad and how the government can really trip you up. Um, that can be subsidized with Edward Burke book, Edmund Burke books. Um, on the other hand, you cannot take necessarily a Hayek scholar and turn him into Sarah Palin. So I think we have, <laughs> we have great stuff to work with in Sarah Palin and somebody who I think wants to work with us, um, who is naturally a conservative and speaks to people who feel naturally conservative. Um, so I, I defend her on many, many points when, when others do not sometimes. Um, so I think I think she certainly has a future. She, does, she draws crowds and raises money uh, like no one. And I think she's, she speaks to folks who are having economic troubles and who do deal with real life problems in a way that other people have not been able to. Um, and I think that she and, and other young leaders, such as Jindal, who uh, has more of that sort of uh, book learning, intellectual, conservative side, uh, can work together to be a really powerful message for us. That was actually going to be my follow-up. Who, who else, uh, Bobby Jindal is one, um, who else are you paying attention to? And who else, who, who should we be paying attention to, all of us in the room, uh, young conservative leaders you see on the rise? Right. Well, I, I love Bobby Jindal. Uh, 
We do have to keep. And in you mind. were able to meet him. You yes, at the governor's I, mansion. Yes, I, I got to go to the governor's mansion. Actually, funny story about that. I went down. <laughs> I flew to New Orleans and drove up to Baton Rouge because it's only an hour and a half away, and uh, I couldn't find a rental car online. And I was like, oh, it must be some sort of glitch. I'll just deal with it when I get down there. So I go to <laughs> I go to New Orleans. I go to the counter, and they're like, no, we don't have any rental cars at all. I was like, ooh, that's going to be a problem. Are there any buses or anything? Mm -hmm. Knowing full well there's no public transportation in southern Louisiana. I'm from the south. I know this. Um, I don't even know why I asked. And she's like, well, we do have this one 15-passenger van. And I was like, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> so I got in my 15-passenger van, white, nondescript, very few windows, wide back, perfect for pushing people in. Um, <laughs> And I drove up to the governor's mansion in my terrorist van <laughs> and remained unmolested by, uh, by the security and, and got out of there unscathed. I was like, Governor, you need a ride anywhere? Um, so no, I did, I did get to meet Governor Jindal in my terrorist van. Uh, and he was nice enough not to have me arrested. So no, I think he's great. We, I think we have to keep in mind that he will be all of 40 in 2012. And Sarah Palin, as well, will be 48. In 2012, so um, you know, I think it's it's not a terrible problem to have that much of our talent is very very young. Um, I, I love Paul Ryan, who has been in the house I believe since he was at the tender age of 28. So there's there are uh, there are many opportunities for you know folks of our age as well moving forward. Uh, Eric Cantor is running for leadership. Um, I think when you can get a a southern right wing Jewish guy in Virginia. You're doing, you're doing well. That is a, that's a precious find in the state of Virginia. And I think he's, he's uh, the great thing about Cantor and, and, uh, and Ryan is that they articulate conservative ideas really well. Um, I think we've been missing a messenger for quite some time when it comes to really getting down to the nitty gritty, somebody who's able to explain health care policy and say, this is why making choices for yourself matters. Um, and taking that issue away from Democrats who can easily say, ah, we'll take care of it for you which is pretty much their talking point. Um, so I think those guys are really, really valuable coming forward. I'm sure you have others as well. Sure, sure. Well, I mean, I think you've, you've covered a very good list. I think that in general, it seems like the House leadership is shaping up to be much younger, maybe yeah. much more in tune with not only getting the message out, but also um, appealing to issues that are more traditionally conservative. <laughs> Before we open it up to all of you, I just wonder, do you have any advice for everybody here in the room, like a, a few things that, that they could do to, um, to really help advance this? I mean, whether it's you know, on, on a, the technological front or whether it's just you know, talking to friends, trying to help. I mean, what advice do you have? Well, I think uh, a couple things. Practically, and I tell young conservative groups this all the time, specifically college students, um, that they're very lucky that they're coming of age in a political time in which knowing how to use Facebook is a marketable skill. Who knew? Um, lucky for them. So uh, that's the, we need to stay on top of those things. Young people particularly are going to be the key to doing that because you know I don't blame older folks in the movement for not wanting to delve into Facebook right about now. Um, people's updates are really schadenfreude in the, uh, in the, the wake of the Obama victory. But, um, but that, that's our duty is to bring those tools to the fore and, uh, and make sure people know how to use them and to stay updated. There are new technologies <laughs> about once a day. And, I, and even for somebody who lives in it, and Rob could probably say the same, we live in this area. And it's still hard to keep up with what's available. I learned about tools that people knew about six months ago that I completely missed because there are just so many. Um, but that's good. There are plenty of tools. And we need to send folks out to know how to use them. One of the problems with the McCain campaign, although I do think that they did online video slightly better than the Obama campaign did. Um, is that on the right, we don't have entrepreneurial, enterprising developers and programmers who look at the internet and say, oh, there's all this great information. We need to figure out ways to funnel it to people and to make tools accessible to them. We don't have somebody making custom tools for us. Uh, Rob mentioned that, he, that the Heritage Group has two Facebook applications, which is um, far and above probably what most uh, conservative organizations are able to put together. But that's, that's the stuff we need to be thinking about. Um, there was another thought I had. Oh, for young folks, I think we need to be careful not, not just on a philosophical level, but, um, but on a, a media level, not to try and fight Democrats on their own turf or fight liberals on their own turf. We're never going to be the hip kids. We're not going to be those kids. It doesn't mean we're not cool. 
but in the, in the sort of general culture, liberals will always be the cool ones. They get that um, out of the box. Hillary Clinton's run I thought was interesting because she became the Republican of the Democratic race, and it was so adorable because the Clintons didn't know how to deal with this. Um, <laughs> she, was sort of, she was sort of tragically unhip and sensible and like made hard decisions, and, and liberals didn't like that, and suddenly they were outcasts, and they were like standing in the corner at the school dance, and the Clintons are like, what? This has never happened to us before. Well, welcome to being a Republican. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's, that's part of our, our lot. The, the media bias is part of our lot, but it just means we have to be better advocates for our cause. Um, I think we need to engender a little bit of uh, it's hip to be square kind of attitude uh, among our young ranks. And I think that's a lot of what Reagan did and what, um, and specifically William F. Buckley did that, you know what, it's cool to want to raise a family and protect your children. It is, uh, it's cool to want to be able to start a business. Uh, these, are not, these are not oppressive things. They're not nerdy things. They're what makes America great. And uh, we need to really own that and be proud of what we espouse. And look liberals straight in the eye and say, you know what, the reason I don't like the welfare state and the reason I don't like government is because it hurts the very people that you're trying to help. Now, if you want to call me a nerd and you want to call me oppressive or what ha whatever slur, because I believe that, that's fine because I'm actually still trying to help people. And it's hard to do that sometimes on college campuses. It's hard to do that in the media when you're, when you're outshouted by other folks. But I think Reagan, Rush Limbaugh, all these you know, folks who we look to, the number one thing they are is proud of what they believe in and sure that it is the moral and right thing to argue. And so we need to make sure we're doing that. Great, that's great advice. Thank you, Mary Catherine. Um, I want to, I'm sure that many of you have questions. Are, are there things that, that Mary Catherine or I, or I can answer for you that's on your minds? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, and if you could just say your name and where you're from. Sure, Raleigh Peters from Burwood, PA. Thanks for joining us today. Um, the journal recently reported that only 38% of Americans actually pay federal income tax. And the Federal Reserve Forbes. Uh, both Forbes and the Wall Street Journal are now reporting that under the Obama plan, if it goes through, <clears throat> that number could go as high as 48% of our country pays zero federal income tax, which means the rest of us who do pay taxes is becoming a, a smaller and smaller group. And it, it just seems to me that the left has a, a built-in voting block right there because, of course, that group is going to want to vote for the big government side. And then you layer on Hollywood, celebrities, mm -hmm et cetera, the media, and it just seems like we have a huge monumental task ahead of us. And I'm just wondering your reactions to any and all of that. Well, I think you're right. <laughs> um, and I think that it's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's unfortunate that we get stuck in these situations where, yes, it, it is really easy to give a handout. I was talking to uh, my brother recently who said, you know, they come into office and they can, you know, make two federal programs that'll bust us in, in 20 years. And you can't reverse them because people are already getting the, uh, you know, the dividends from them. We come in and, and put in tax cuts, and it's like that. They're out the window. You know, this, is, uh, this is part of our lot. Our, our argument, I think, is harder to make, which means we have to be smarter. Luckily, we are a lot of the time. Um, <laughs> uh, and yeah, there are ob obstacles for us, but we can't you know, whine about them. And I, I think the media is a problem in many ways, Hollywood problem in many ways, um, <clears throat> sort of the, the defining culture of TV and and movies, um, but it's something that we can overcome. I think uh, Rasmussen wrote a, a, Scott Rasmussen, the pollster, wrote a Wall Street Journal piece today saying that his polling shows that Reaganism is still the guiding uh, philosophy of, of most Americans, and this was a lot had to do with a protest election, and a lot had to do with the fact that Obama sold the message very well that he was a tax cutter. <laughs> And that he uh, you know, saw America as this land of opportunity. And he, he spoke the language in many ways that Reagan did. Um, some of his other programs, not so much. But uh, I, don't, I think that the country is predisposed to agree with us. Um, but it's, it's, it's going to be a hard fight. You know, 48, especially with, uh, with folks, the number of, of, of taxpayers declining. But 48%, you've got to remember, we still got 2% to work with there. <laughs> and it's, it is our duty to go after those folks and to, to really express, I go back to the morality of our side um, and what we believe in on an economic level. And 
you know, not to let everybody get away with this economic justice uh, argument that's so easy and is basically socialism, uh, and to give way to that. It's our it's our duty every day to go out and, and fight against that. But I do you know I do worry sincerely about us getting over fifty percent of folks who don't pay income taxes, and then we're we're in trouble. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I would just add that I think um, you know preaching the message of freedom. Uh, you know, and I, I also think that um, you know Rahm Emanuel suggested this weekend that they're going to go forward with the middle class tax cuts and then raise taxes on everybody on couples over two hundred fifty thousand. I think when uh, you start to see that not perhaps playing out the way that they envision, um, you may you may have some backlash. So, did somebody else have a question? Yes, sir. First of all, uh, I think Obama, um, when he said he was going to go line by line with the budget, I believe he's going to go line by line, and then he's going to make more organizations <laughs> to regulate the ones that aren't working. Probably. So I, I believe him when he says that. Um, and probably those organizations won't do their jobs correctly. Um, and the other question that I had is, um, how do you, do you see a solution to the problem on college campuses where conservatism is not even understood what, what the principles are. Yeah. You know, um, when we went and passed out a packet on socialism and, you know, why it's not right for America, um, you know, the first thing that happened as we were walking up, we were first called terrorists, which was very ironic. <laughs> um, and then, uh, you know, the next uh, couple of days later, uh, Kid sat down and said they were all lies, and I asked him uh, which which part of the packet was lies, and he said he didn't know he didn't actually read it. So how do you get people motivated enough to actually open their eyes? Um, I think on college campuses, um, one thing I've, that I think is really helpful for us, um, and this is not to say that you don't carry the message in other in other positive ways as well, but I think one of the advantages for us on campuses just because they're so insane is that um, when you're looking to expose liberals for what they really are, a college campus is what you would call a target-rich environment. And uh, I believe the, at Columbia when the Minutemen spoke and they were, you know, attacked because, by the well-meaning and tolerant liberals in the audience, um, attacked and, you know, shouted, out, shouted down and all these things, um, I think that YouTube video got something like Three million views or something, and I. It was it was the local it was the college TV station that that took that video. I think as conservatives there are a thousand uh, opportunities like that to really expose these folks for for what they are, uh, and that we should be out there with the cameras to do it. It's it's a fairly easy thing. Um, any code pink gathering on your campus is is liable to create some sort of. Uh, situation that's helpful in defining the opposition. Uh, and I think that that, in turn, helps you pitch to, to other uh, college students. Like, is this really where you want to go? Is this who you want to be hanging out with? Um, but much like the media, there is, there's an institutional bias against us in these ways. But it also, uh, and this is, I grew up in a very liberal hometown, Durham, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Um, and I found that being the only conservative that any of my friends know, period, well, my family, my family's the token conservative family, um, was helpful in honing my own philosophy and making, no, making sure I knew where I stood and could communicate those things. So it has the potential to make all of us stronger. And it's, we're not going to beat the institutional bias of, of all of the professors in the United States. But, uh, but I think that we can have the courage to become better debaters and even at times to, uh, to challenge your professors in class, which is very helpful. A friend of mine at Yale, uh, they were having a discussion in a foreign relations class about the International Criminal Court. And uh, the teacher gave them, the professor gave them no readings at all on why there was a sensible constitutional reason that America was not involved in the ICC, because you'd have to amend the Constitution in order to do it. Uh, no readings at all. So he raises his hand and says, you know, um, I would really like to read something about how there's a sensible intellectual argument for why America is not involved in the International Criminal Court. Uh, the only reason I know that is because I don't trust the syllabus and I go and I do outside reading. And uh, he happens to be rather bold. Um, 
<laughs> and, uh, but because he did this, and most of the people in the class are liberal, several of them raised their hands and were like, yeah, why don't we know that? That would be helpful. <laughs> so there are, there are small victories to be won um, on college campuses, and there are large victories to be won in exposing the left for exactly what it wants to do. Yes, in the back there. Karen Agnes from Charlottesville. Hey. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to, you know, right now we keep hearing about all the terrible things that are going to happen in the administration, whether it's appointments, you know, Supreme Court appointments, uh, issues. Can you talk about what you think we should be most scared of and <laughs> really kind of rally the troops to fight against? Oh, goodness. There's so many things to choose from. <laughs> um, Gosh, I'll give you a minute to think. I'll, yeah. I'll tell you, one, one project that we're working on at Heritage is uh, called Stop the EPA. And the, uh, um, as, as you're, you're probably aware, the EPA is considering regulating carbon dioxide uh, you know, in, in hopes of stopping global warming. And even though it would only have uh, minimal effect in terms of changing temperature or perhaps no effect, um, Obama and his advisors have promised that they're going to go ahead with this regardless. They're going to basically cut the, the public comment period off. So um, I think you have until the 28th of November at stopepa.com. We've set up a website where you can actually register a comment um, because the EPA will listen to you. So I mean, we know that this is coming. We know that Obama's doing it. And, and this is so dramatic that you'll be regulated. I mean, things like your charcoal grill or your lawnmower are going to be regulated. So um, you'll have to get a, a sticker from the government to do this. So I mean, this is, uh, I would say, going to affect most of your lives um, in something that I'd pay attention to. Um, I mean, I would say I'm an economic conservative first, so that's always been what I'm interested in. And so I would worry, number one, about a tax hike during <laughs> uh, an economic downturn. Specifically, I, I grew up in North Carolina around a lot of folks who have very small business who are, who are contractors, who do painting, um, construction, that kind of thing. And, uh, and this started hurting them you know, years ago with the talk of how they weren't going to extend the Bush tax cuts. You know, every time there's even a debate about it, people start hedging and cutting back. And, I understand that Democrats don't understand that there are consequences for these things. Um, so we have to make clear that there are. And uh, that's one of the things I'm, I'm really worried about. I, w I would have hoped that, uh, I think Barack Obama, although he is a cipher to a large degree, I think one thing I learned about him throughout the campaign is that first and foremost, he's a political opportunist, I think more than a liberal. Um, and so I think that actually gives us some power in controlling him or containing him by, uh, shining light on what he's, he's trying to pass, for instance, the tax hikes for the 250000 and above, which it would have been wise of him to hold off on. Um, but if he's going to go there, we shine the light on that. The American people don't like it, and he will be reined in to some degree. Because I think uh, he's a guy whose approval ratings fall below 60, and he gets real antsy. Um, or that's, that's my sense of it, at least, um, from watching the campaign. Um, the other thing, I've, I worry about Iran, of course. Is the, is the big one. I think, you know, Obama's team has said, or, or there have been leaks and, and such that said that he's sort of following the Clinton model, trying not to over, or trying to uh, learn from the Clinton mistakes and not overreach in those first two years. Uh, but what worries me if he's watching the Clinton years is that there's no foreign policy uh, pattern to watch or, or nothing of substance really uh, compared to the world we're living in today. So that's what concerns me. He, he does have several practical people around him, but um, Rob and I were talking about this, this conversation that he had with the Polish minister, where miraculously, the Polish minister gets an entirely different uh, uh, message about what he wants to do with, uh, with missiles than Barack Obama delivers in the press, which, if you were watching the campaign, is not at all surprising, uh, but has greater greater consequences on an international absolutely. level. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, sir. Um, Scott Faley, I'm from Chevy Chase, Maryland. You sort of answered this already um, when you're talking about the need for the Republicans to sell a presidential candidate like an, I like an iPod, and we're not the most you know, glitzy and glamorous party. And it seems like the opportunity right now with, with a significant loss is to go back to to basics and revisit first principles. Um, but I was, the thing that's remarkable to me about the last, this past election is that Obama, the, Obama's message was himself. 
message was the messenger. And how are conservatives prepared to answer that? How, can you look at history and see an example, a previous Democrat example, where that was the case, where there was someone who was so, so immensely popular? Uh, and how do we deal with defeating them? And is it an opportunity, or is it a huge challenge? Do you want to start? Go um, for it. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I think it's a, a rare guy and a rare moment in history where you can actually pull that off. Um, I didn't think it was going to, for a long time, I didn't think it was actually going to happen. And I think in September, there were good reasons for thinking it wouldn't with, with McCain ahead um, for a brief while there before the, <laughs> before the Lehman Brothers collapse. Um, so I'm not sure that that's something that Democrats can count on for very long. Uh, he's going to either make the large majority of American voters mad by moving very, very far left, or he's going to um, make his base mad by not moving far enough left. So he's, he has to, the guy who's been floating above the clouds now has to descend on his pegasus, pegasus and deal with actual political issues. Um, I think from, from what we've seen, he's not terribly decisive. He's not, uh, he's not somebody who necessarily wants to get involved in that stuff. It certainly doesn't help his brand. Um, but he has to because he's the president. Um, so I think that that's something Democrats are going to have to watch out for, and it's not going to necessarily you know, carry them through several elections. As far as our answer to it, I don't, I don't think we want to model ourselves on that uh, at all. Um, my point, and I think that's what some people say about, about Palin, is that she would just be a good, she's the message, which I, I disagree with because I think she's philosophically um, a conservative on both fronts and, uh, and pretty decent at communicating those things, I think, towards the end of the, the campaign. Um, so I disagree that she's just the message herself. Um, but I don't think that we want to go all the way in the Barack Obama direction at all. Um, our, the key to our success uh, for many years has been uh, communicating that these ideas are important, that they're what make, what make America work, that they're what make people happy and give them pride in what they're doing with their lives. And, uh, and we shouldn't forego that for the iPod style, although that must be part of our, um, part of our plan moving forward. Yeah, and I'd agree with that. And I, I think that, you know, you mentioned the first principles. I mean, I think that's, you know, really essential. And I think you're already starting to see people talk about that in, in the wake of the, the loss on Tuesday. I mean, that was, you're hearing at least from the, the leadership races in the, in the House. Um, I, you know, I think that, uh, I think for, for many of these people, they, it, it was so much about image in, in the primaries, for, especially, you know, for the Republicans. I mean, you had, uh, Mitt Romney and Mike Huckabee and and McCain to a certain extent they were all running on like a, a personal biography you know with Romney it was he saved the Olympics with Huckabee it was you know he had overcome these these great struggles with his weight and diabetes and with McCain it was his war hero you know status so um, you know <laughs> let's get back to to some of the principles and have them talk about that and we'll see and as far as Obama goes I think you're absolutely right. You've said it a couple times now. If you look at the issues that he actually ran on, and we made this point last week for Heritage, um, and probably some of the mailings that you got, and I think Dr. Fulner has, has made it uh, you know, repeatedly, um, it, you know, it's not, it's not that conservatism has gone out of style or people are shifting away from it. In, in many cases, some of the ideas that Obama was floating were pretty conservative. Uh, yeah. the, the tax cuts, expanding the military. Um, you know, talking about uh, parental responsibility. I mean, so it's not like he was running um, a, a campaign out of the Center for American Progress or the Brookings Institution. He, he, he wasn't doing that. So we'll see how he actually governs. But um, it should be very interesting to watch these next two yeah. years. I think I'm, like, getting a signal from John here. But I wanted to add, to um, that I think uh, perhaps a lesson that can be drawn from, from running on personal biographies is that, you know, we tried the Obama approach against Obama, and it didn't work for us. <laughs> um, and that uh, I, one thing I noticed during the primaries, uh, specifically before, before Rudy uh, whoo, crashed and burned, um, was that when he talked about free market health care, and he was very good about talking about he was very good at talking about it and explaining it properly, uh, those uncommitted voter stripes went up, 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 um, if you were watching any of those debates when he really hit on that. I think that's something that we really missed out on this time around. 
I think we have a good message to communicate. It's a little bit difficult to communicate, uh, but it needs to be out there. And man, the rest of the world is going to get a, a wake-up call when they realize we were subsidizing their health care the whole time. If they end up nationalizing <laughs> ours, they're like, oh, wait, where did all the drugs go? Um, and this is something we need to communicate to people, that they want to have control over they, these things. Um, you know, point out the, the defectors of uh, nationalized health care, every high-placed political appointee and political uh, person in every nationalized healthcare country comes here for treatment. I mean, these are things we need to point out and, and talk about, and it, it hits people in the wallet, which is, uh, which is where we need to be speaking right now. Yes. Thank you. I'm uh, Mark Wetrich. I'm from the Dallas-Fort Worth uh, chapter. Um, my question pertains to some information I saw on various news stations in the immediate aftermath of the election. Um, exit polls, which I know aren't necessarily always 100% reliable, but um, they did indicate that um, when people were asked what the primary issue they were focused on uh, in deciding their vote, um, overwhelmingly, I think it was something like 65%, and that's even, even more of when you consider the number of issues available, uh, said that the economy was the reason that they had voted, uh, regardless of whether or not they voted for McCain or Obama. And uh, way down at the bottom of the totem pole was uh, national defense, defense of our country. I think it was something like 7%. So even if you're talking about you know, margins of error, I don't think it was very close. Right. Um, as someone who's, who's of the belief that the president's number one job, first and foremost, is to protect the country, that was a very disturbing statistic to me. Um, and in particular, my number one worry happens to be the Iran issue that you touched upon briefly and uh, Obama's uh, inclination to perhaps sit down with no pretenses and let our uh, own morals uh, be the subject of debate. Um, is there something you can think of in which we can um, sort of get people more interested in the fact that national defense is important? I think it's very ironic that in the aftermath of 9-11, we haven't had any attacks on our country. And the, uh, the result of that, in my opinion, has not been to laud the presidency or, or laud Bush or anyone involved, right. but instead to be lulled to sleep and to think that it can't happen again. It's a very ironic uh, result of, the, of our success. Um, what can we do to keep people interested in that and realize that it's still a, a viable problem and not to be ignored in the future? Well, yeah, I, I think you're correct in that. I, Bill Crystal actually at the Weekly Standard wrote um, a really nice editorial this week about the fact that um, Republican victories on national security beget Democratic victories. <laughs> um, the, the fact that the war was not an issue towards the end of the campaign was because it was successful. Uh, the fact that national security slipped down is because we haven't been attacked since 9-11. And uh, that gives us the luxury of having a domestic economic uh, campaign, uh, which is good. Yay for us. Um, we won't get credit for it. But, uh, and, and yes, the result is ironic. But that is something that, that we, are, we are good at. And it's happened repeatedly uh, throughout history. Um, I think that national security will come to the fore uh, probably not, I don't, I'm not saying like a domestic attack or anything. I'm going to end up on Huffington Post or something. Um, <clears throat> not through a domestic attack, but just through uh, Iran and Russia specifically are in dire straits right now because their, their fuel money is, their petrodollars are plummeting. They've promised all sorts of expansionism to their people. Uh, the actual running of the countries on a domestic basis is awful. And uh, they're going to have to answer for the fact that it's not all, it was, it was covered over. A multitude of sins were covered over by petrodollars, and now they're not. So um, I think the, in talking to people who are much smarter about foreign policy than I am, uh, the result is going to be, to some extent, that they're, they're going to want to provoke a confrontation of some sort, it, and it may just be diplomatic and a lot of shouting and, and that kind of thing, uh, and make it look like the US provoked it. So they can blame it all on us, because we are, of course, the, uh, the target for such things. Um, so I think there's, there's significant volatility. Um, and I would hope that the, the pragmatic folks that Obama has in his administration would recognize that and would, would act accordingly. Um, so I think that it's, in this era, it's going to come up again and again. But at the, during this, during this uh, election, it was clearly the headliner was economics. And responding to that, we can't rest on our laurels as being a national security party. And uh, I, think, I think that image 
was diminished somewhat by failures in the war on terror and then was eventually redeemed uh, by the surge and, and what's going on now. Um, but we can't rest on those laurels as a national security party. Yes, uh, Republicans will, will likely be voted in again if something were to happen or if there were perceived threats were greater. Uh, but we need a message that works here at home just as well as theirs does uh, and better. <laughs> so that's something we need to be thinking about. Yeah, and I, I think the, the other thing, I noticed that CNN now for several months has been running what they call the number one issue, and it's the economy. I mean, when you, when you have it constantly hammered into your head that this is the only thing that you should be paying attention to when you hear about it on the evening news and you constantly see this on, on blogs or, or, or websites, I mean, naturally people are probably going to say that, and I think it's probably a shift. I don't remember what the exit polling from the 2006 election said, but if I recall, I, that, that was pretty much... I mean, I, I, it, it, the um, law, Republican losses were attributed to the to fact the, that the war wasn't going as well yeah. as it, it could have been. So, yeah. um, so you know, I, I don't know, but I agree with you. And I think that um, as Obama is tested, as he was with, with Russia this past week, it's going to emerge again as, as a big issue. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, if somebody has it. Yes, in the back. One thing I noticed in the debate uh, was this level of speaking to issues as if all Americans understood. And I think sometimes cons uh, conservatives have a trouble with realizing the fact that only 7% of Americans actually follow politics. And we kind of had this assumption that everybody knows what we're talking about. And without sounding condescending or that we're smarter than you, how can conservatives communicate our ideas such as in debates uh, where John McCain could have easily described so many of these issues and explain why Obama's platforms were gonna come around and hurt us actually. How do we do that? Well, this is one of the reasons that I go back to the fact that somebody like Sarah Palin shouldn't be jettisoned uh, blithely uh, because um, she's someone who can make those arguments and draw people in to hear them. So that's one of my, my points I make about her and when we're having these debates. Um, so I, I think the messenger matters. I think we've been missing, um, you know, a great messenger for, for sort of what are admittedly sometimes complex conservative ideas but need to be boiled down to something that people understand. We've been missing a messenger on those things, and I think it's, it really has to be a priority when we're looking for who's going to run in 2012 that it has to be somebody who can really competently communicate these things. Um, I think you look back to the primaries to something like Giuliani's discussion of, of health care. Um, he's a very gifted communicator, and that's why he was able to carry that message. Um, and so I think that, that cannot be overlooked at all, even though it sounds like, you know, we're sort of yeah. being Yeah, well, one of the about. things that I was going to mention is Mary Catherine, you know, is very humble, and she wouldn't uh, say this, but she herself has communicated in, in, in ways that I think reach a far greater audience than we traditionally do, and that's through the use of uh, online video. I mean, she's very talented in what she's been able to do, and if you look on, on YouTube and, and see some of the things, the way she's um, communicated about conservative issues, it's been very effective, and there are other people doing the same thing um, in terms of media bias, uh, Newsbusters has a series called Noobs Busted, and it, it makes fun in a way that you know you can laugh about it, and I think it reaches a, a broader audience that way. She mentioned Facebook as another example. There are a lot of your friends who are probably on Facebook who who are are among that 93% that really doesn't follow politics closely, but because they know you and they they probably trust you, um, you can have an impact on them. So um, I would be thinking about different ways like that. I don't know yeah. if you wanted to. No, I think, I think humor is very important. Yeah. This is a, a talk I give to young conservatives in general is that you know, that has to be an important ingredient in what we're doing. It's not the only thing. Um, and admittedly, some of my YouTube videos are very silly, which can be found at youtube.com slash mkhammer. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> admittedly, some of them are very silly, but they move messages. Uh, and they move messages to people who we're not necessarily that great at hitting normally. Another thing about online video, I think, that, uh, is that folks, folks' willingness to consume a, a longer video online is going up. Um, you saw the Obama campaign used to, to some degree of success. I don't think a, a bunch. It was a little too long. The Keating Five documentary that they did that was 12 minutes long. Uh, the McCain campaign did several things that were several minutes long, which I think were helpful. Um, and I think that when we can't communicate in a debate form the complexity of the idea or really get down to the nub of what we want to discuss and point out all the, the contingencies, 
uh, that online video might be a great way to do that. Specifically, I'm actually trying to work on in the future um, doing sort of a step-by-step -step explanation of like conservative healthcare uh, in five steps. This is what it means. Add some humor to it, make it cute. Uh, and if it's a policy question um, and not a politics question, it has the ability to reach people that wouldn't necessarily otherwise be reached if you can send it around that way. So. That's great. Great advice. Oh, oh, I, wanted yeah, to, sure. I wanted to add one more thing. I meant to say this. Um, or two more things. Quick, uh, that we cannot take for granted that the whole country is like, yay, Reagan. Um, because, you know, in conservative circles, are, they're like Sunday school circles where uh, in Sunday school the only answer is Jesus. Jesus. For every question. In our circles, the only answer is Reagan. In every, gosh. In every, uh, in every discussion, it's Reagan. Um, I think we, obviously, we owe so, so much to Reagan. And uh, looking forward, we have to use him as a, as a guidepost. But I think that uh, we can't take for granted that the whole country is a Reaganite country. Um, we have to resell these ideas. We have to uh, repackage them when the times call for it. And we don't need to get squishy, but we cannot take for granted that people are necessarily going to fall in line because it's a center-right nation. And the second thing is, a good way to fight that is that all of you guys are already doing it, working on a local level, which is something I think we overlook, ironically, because we're conservatives and don't uh, hold up the federal government as the, the agent of change and, and efficiency. Uh, but I don't think we focus enough on, on local races, on even city and county things, um, where you guys can be really helpful and, and recruit soldiers to work in those fields where we can really make strides. So. No, that's, that's great, and I, I, I want to thank you for, for being here with us. I, I know that we can stick around and talk to you more if other people have questions, but I, I want to thank you for the opportunity to, to chat today. This was, this was really great hearing from you what's on your minds, and uh, thank John for, for inviting us. Well, thank you uh, both Rob and Mary Catherine, and uh, please join me in a, in a big uh, round of applause for you.